Okay, good morning again. Thank you for joining us and welcome to the webinar, Funding for Zero Emission Vehicles, co-hosted by ACT News in the Port of San Diego. My name is Bree Lawrence and I'm a Vice President at Gladstein Neandros & Associates, a consulting firm based in Santa Monica, California, focused on clean transportation. And I'm looking forward to talking to you today on today's webinar. So funding for zero emission vehicles and getting incentives in general can be complex and intimidating. So today we're going to talk through what's available and what does it take to put together a successful proposal and then what you need to be prepared for because submitting an application is really the beginning of a multi-year journey. Today's webinar is focused on drayage particularly in the San Diego area. And if you are attending and you are thinking about a different vehicle type or in a different area, then we can talk about opportunities that may be a better fit for you at another time. But I think you're going to see that there's a lot of overlap in what we talk about and what you're doing. You can take it to the next slide. And before we get started, there are a few quick housekeeping items. There's going to be a Q&A at the end. And so please do submit questions that you have in the Q&A box in the bottom right-hand corner. You can direct your questions to the organizer. There's also going to be a quick survey after the webinar ends. Please fill that out if you have the time to do so. There's also going to be some pieces of information that are a bit more technical. And there's going to be a recording of this webinar you can rewatch it, pause it, rewind. So no pressure on trying to take notes or capture screenshots. You can always reference back to this. And then if you do have any technical issues, you can reach out to Stefan using his email address on the screen. All right, next slide. And today you're going to be hearing from me and we may not need the full hour. We'll see how the Q&A goes. But joining me, we do have representatives from the Port of San Diego. And Phil, I'd love if you just want to pop on and, and say a few welcoming remarks. Sure. Thanks, Bree, and good morning, everyone. Uh, we're happy to be partnering with ACT News and GNA this morning to bring you this topic on funding for zero emission vehicles. I, I talk to a lot of truck operators and fleets about zero emission vehicles and how to pay for them is, is definitely one of the top one to two questions that I get asked. So um, there's lots of funding out there as we'll learn about today, but it can be overwhelming. Uh, and Bree is, is going to explain all the ins and outs of that for you today. So thanks so much. I'll turn it back to you, Bree. Thank you, Phil. And feel free to pop in as you'd like throughout. Alrighty, you can take it to our next slide. So here's what we're going to be going through. I'm gonna to touch quickly on some of the information covered during the last webinar. I'm gonna talk about what you can get funding for, and again, what you should be thinking about and what you should be prepared for afterwards. Go ahead to the next slide. Okay, so if you were not able to attend last week's webinar, I really encourage you to go back and watch that one. Funding, is a very exciting thing to talk about. Going after it, securing that award is really, really cool. But you have to go into it knowing why, and you have to go into it knowing what zero emission technology options work for you. So that why piece, that comes from regulation. So during last week's webinar, our regulatory expert, Sean Coca, talked about the advanced clean fleet rule and how that is particularly going to affect drayage fleets. So just to re um, underscore a couple points that he made, I'm going to do that real quick. Not going to go super into the weeds. Bottom line is by 2035, drayage trucks operating in California will be zero emission and that will be phased in over time. How quickly will that be phased in over time? Well, starting January 1, 2024, you can only add a new truck to the drayage truck registry if it's zero emission, meaning battery electric or hydrogen fuel cell. So if you have any intention of getting a new vehicle 
and you are not going to be able to get that vehicle before the end of this year, you will have no other option except to get a battery electric or hydrogen fuel cell vehicle starting next year. Go ahead to the next slide. And there are a couple of other things to make note of. And you may say, I'll just hold on to my truck forever then. Um, but that will not be something that you can do. So you can see down here at the bottom, two things to call out. You will have to turn over your vehicle once it reaches 18 years of age. And then once it reaches 800,000 miles or once it reaches 800,000 miles. And if your vehicle is um, 13 years old, that's when you have to start reporting. So they know that you're getting a year closer every year to that 18 year limit. Go ahead to the next slide. And then beyond that regulatory overview, uh, on last week's webinar, Patrick Couch from our technical team, he shared a nice overview of some of the options that are available right now in the zero emission space. So you're seeing some names on here that you're probably familiar with. You're also seeing that there are some new OEMs in this space that you may want to consider. You can go ahead and click through and you're going to get to see some of the mileage that these vehicles are capable of. And that is going to change over the lifetime of that vehicle. So you're going to see what it looks like as a new vehicle um, and then how that mileage will decrease or that range uh, will decrease as that vehicle ends uh, or gets closer to the end of its life. Go ahead to the next slide. And then beyond getting a new battery electric vehicle, as you enter this space, you are also going to have to start thinking about where am I going to charge this vehicle? So Patrick on last week's webinar took us through the various infrastructure components and it's more than just a charger. So you're going to see this is everything from power supply all the way through to the charger and then of course the vehicle itself. And he had a few key takeaways that you're gonna see here on the next slide. So a few things um, just to call out. I'm not gonna read through these, but I wanna reiterate a few points. Getting started as soon as possible, knowing what your operational needs are. So just as a first example, you saw some of the ranges on um, that previous slide with the trucks. You need to know, does that work for me? Do all of these options work for me? So just looking at what's out there, what fits your needs, what your timing looks like based off of the age of your existing vehicles. And then, and only then, is it appropriate to start talking about grant funding, which is where we're gonna go now. So you can take it to the next slide which will likely look familiar. You can go ahead and click through a couple times just till we get our stars up there. So when we talk about grant funding, we take a very holistic look at it. If you are only getting funding for the vehicle, you may not then be able to afford all of your infrastructure needs. And if you're only looking at the infrastructure, you may be blown away by the price tag of that electric vehicle. So today we are looking at it all and what I'm showing you are just a few examples of things that we're gonna talk about so that when you approach this, you know that you have all of your bases covered. You can take it to the next slide. Okay, on this slide, you are seeing an overview of the landscape for drage trucks in the San Diego area. I wanna call out a few things here. First thing, you're seeing some little stars on the left. And what that little star means is that there is a component of that program that will be uh, beneficial to a small fleet. And I'll give you those examples in just a moment. Beyond that, you are seeing programs that are available either locally in San Diego or statewide for all of California. And what you're not seeing are federal programs. There's a lot of federal money out there, several programs that are friendly towards battery electric and hydrogen trucks. However, those programs typically require that the applicant is a public agency. Um, for example, the San Diego Air Pollution Control District is an eligible applicant for those federal programs. 
And not that you can't get funding that way, it just requires another level of coordination that may be out of your control. So today we are talking about the programs that you as the fleet, you can apply for directly and get money either locally or at the state level. So these are very high level details. When making a decision to apply, you're definitely gonna get more into the weeds for each of these items. And we're gonna take you through a couple of examples. Um, but before doing that, I do wanna explain some of the benefits to smaller fleets because there's a good chance that if you're on this call, maybe you have less than 20 vehicles or less than 10 vehicles. So for the first one, the Clean Air for All program, you see under the maximum that it says you could get up to 50% of the vehicle cost. That's not a bad deal, 50%, that's nice. But if you are a small fleet and you have 10 or fewer vehicles, you could get up to 80% of the cost of the vehicle. Now that's a really, really good deal. Below that, you see the San Diego Air Pollution Control District Voucher Incentive Program. This is actually a sub program to the Clean Air for All program that is only for fleets that have 10 or fewer vehicles. It's a quicker voucher process. This is on here, but please note that the San Diego Air Pollution Control District hasn't committed to reopening the program this year. So it's not one that we're gonna focus on because I do want our conversation to be about options that are available now or near term. And then moving on down to the bottom, there is the Innovative Small E-Fleet Program. Just as its name suggests, it's only for small fleets. And by small, in this case, it means that you could get, uh, you have to have less than 20 vehicles and less than 15 million in annual revenue. And last but not least, the last small fleet perk that I wanted to highlight is that through the HBIT program, if you are a fleet and you have less than 10 vehicles, you are able to stack with other programs at the state level and you're the only fleet size that's able to do that. If you have more than 10 vehicles in the state of California, you are not allowed to stack with those other state programs. So that just opens the door to some more possibilities for small fleets. So what I would like to do now is I want to take you through a few examples of how these programs can be combined. Now, please do keep in mind that these examples assume that you have already gone through some of the eligibility criteria. And we're gonna talk about that in a little bit. So we're gonna go through some scenarios and there are only a few examples. There are a lot of different ways to combine these programs. So let's go ahead and, and start working through some of these examples on the next slide. Oh shoot, I forgot. One very important note, and this is something that um, I want to, it has its own slide for a reason. If you are getting a zero emission, medium or heavy duty vehicle, there is a tax credit that you just need to make sure you don't forget to claim. So in every case, for those scenarios that we talk through, you're always going to see this tax credit. It's $40,000 for a um, heavy, medium or heavy duty vehicle. There's no catch and there's no cap. There are no reporting requirements. This is something that came out of the Inflation Reduction Act to encourage fleets to adopt these vehicles. So beyond the grant funding that we're gonna talk about today, there is this tax credit. You're gonna see it in every example as something that you should be leveraging when you are going after funding for an electric vehicle. All right, now to our examples. Okay, so there are going to be four, and this is our first example. This example is assuming that you are in a disadvantaged community, and we'll talk about how you can determine that. And this is going to assume that you have 10 or fewer vehicles because I called out that there are some benefits to being a smaller fleet. And so you're going to see differences between these examples based off of fleet size and based off of location. 
So as an example of how these incentives can be combined, if you plan on having your charging infrastructure at your own location for private use, by all means, you should be working with SDG E to assess your eligibility for their Power Your Drive for Fleets program. That program is gonna take care of everything up to your charger. So we showed that graphic before that showed the meter, um, it showed the transformer. And if you use their program, you don't have to worry about the costs of those pieces of the infrastructure. They will cover that. Also, because in this example, the fleet is in a disadvantaged community, you're also eligible for a rebate that would cover part of the charger cost. So naturally, start with talking to your utility and taking advantage of their program as much as possible. They aren't going to cover the full cost of the charger in the installation, which is where this Energize Jumpstart program comes into play. This is a program that is only for fleets that are in disadvantaged communities, and it's gonna help you cover the remaining cost of your charger in addition to software for your charger, because think of it like a phone. You have a phone, but then you have AT&T or Verizon. So you have to also have your software and this program will cover that. And then it will also help you cover your installation. And those are two items that are packaged on the infrastructure side. On the vehicle side, of course, you're gonna to wanna to take advantage of that federal tax credit. And then you're going to want to look at combining a local incentive and a state level incentive. So the HFIT program will provide $150,000 towards a zero emission vehicle. And then locally, San Diego has its Clean Air for All program. They also have a zero emission pilot program that's open right now that you can combine. And together, all three of these combined, you are going to be able to cover 85% of the total cost if you're using the Clean Air for All program, or if you're using that pilot program, up to 90% of the cost. So those three combined, you'll, you'll be able to get 90% of the cost of the electric vehicle. And by using those infrastructure programs together, you may find that you have your entire cost uh, with maybe just a little bit left on the installation side and uh, software side for the infrastructure. So not a bad setup. You can take us to our next example. Okay, so you may have seen that example and said, wow, that looks great, but my fleet has greater than 10 vehicles. Okay, well, you're seeing the same programs. The biggest difference is that down there at the bottom, you're seeing you have to make a choice. If you have more than 10 vehicles, you won't be able to combine those programs. You will have to pick one or the other. And you're like, well, how will I know which one to pick? Well, it's likely gonna come down to whether or not you have a vehicle that you can get rid of. That HFIT program in the bottom right, that doesn't require any scrappage, meaning you don't have to get rid of anything. The San Diego Clean Air for All and Pilot program, those, if you're scrapping a vehicle, you can get more money. So because you can get more money if you scrap something, you may go that direction so that you can get the most for the vehicle. But everything on the infrastructure side remains the same. Okay, on to our next example. Well, you may be thinking, dang it, I'm, a large, I'm, I'm larger than 10 vehicles and I'm not in a disadvantaged community. So what's out there for me? Okay, still the same number of programs you're just going to see that a couple of things are going to change. So from the utility, because you're not in a disadvantaged community, you won't be eligible for that charger rebate. That's why that is crossed out in red. You're still seeing the Energize program, but you're not seeing the Jumpstart lane. The Jumpstart lane requires that you're in a disadvantaged community, and you saw it would cover up to 75% of your charger and um, in software costs. This fast track lane is gonna cover 50% and it's only gonna be for the charger and the software. So the difference now is you can get 50% of your charger and your software costs covered, but there's nothing covering your installation 
and you're solely relying on that fast track program for your charger and software costs. On the vehicle side, you're still seeing the federal tax credit and you're still seeing the HFIT program. You're still seeing the Clean Air for All program. You're not seeing that zero emission pilot anymore at the local level because that requires that you are in an identified disadvantaged community. All right, and we'll take it to our last example here. So if you are a small fleet and you are, um, if you are a small fleet and you're not in a disadvantaged community, you won't be eligible for that Jumpstart program. You won't be eligible for that charger rebate from SDG&E, but you will still now be able to stack programs for your vehicle. So for those bottom two, you're not seeing that or, you don't have to make a choice. You can go after both of these and still cover up to 85 to 90% of your new zero emission vehicle cost. So those are just a couple of examples of how these programs can be combined. You didn't see a couple of programs that were on my list in the examples, and I'll share why. One program that you didn't see in the examples was the Innovative Small E-Fleet Program. That program is unique in that it is supposed to serve as a standalone incentive, as a, a one-stop shop. Um, for example, the offerings from the Innovative Small E-Fleet Program include trucking as a service, where you are a small fleet, you pick a provider, they're gonna do all of the work for you and you just have to say, I wanna operate a heavy duty electric vehicle and I'm gonna pay X dollars per month to do so, um, which is a completely different model than some of these. It is more simple, um, but the, there's a lot less funding in that program and it is first come first serve. So you really have to be ready to go and ready to submit as soon as that program opens. Another program that you didn't see on here is the Volkswagen program for class eight. And the reason why you're not seeing that program is because it's not stacking friendly with, with the HBIT program, with the Clean Air for All program. And it also, as far as scrappage goes, it requires that you turn in a truck that is model year 2010 through engine model year 2012. And a lot of fleets don't have a vehicle in that range. And so it's a program that isn't accessible to them. So just want to call out why you didn't see a couple of programs in my examples. And like I said, there are other ways that you can mix and match these. All right, so we've talked about some examples and what's out there and how much you can get. And now we're gonna talk about whether or not it's worth making the decision to actually pursue funding. So a couple of things that are really worth thinking through before you make a decision to apply include are you an eligible applicant? You may see that a program is for school buses. You may just see, you know, 50% of battery electric vehicle costs, and then you read the five print, and it's like for school districts. Um, so you do want to make sure that the program is friendly towards your entity type and your vehicle type. Another item you want to keep your eye on is when our applications do because we're going to talk about the different pieces of a grant that are required and if you don't have time to prepare those in time and you miss that due date you're likely going to have to wait in most cases a year for that program to return so you want to make sure that you have a long enough runway to actually submit your application and pro tip if a program says it's going to be first come first served you really wanna treat the opening day as the due date. You wanna be first in line. And by sharing some of the items that it takes to apply, we're hoping that you can be exactly that, first in line. In California in particular, you see that a lot of programs do focus on a particular area. It could be a county, it could be utility boundaries, it could be disadvantaged communities, and so, seeing where they want to fund projects and then checking to see if your location where you domicile is in one of those areas will help you determine whether or not you should apply. And then the last couple of items 
you want to make sure you can get enough money from the program that you can actually do the project if awarded. A program could look fabulous, but if they are going to give you $50,000, that just may not be enough, even if you are eligible and competitive. We talked about scrappage briefly and just making sure that you have something that you can turn in if that is required and that you meet the eligibility, meaning they may want you to have owned that truck for one or two years, that there was no lapse in registration during those one or two years as just a couple of examples. And then last but not least, grants are going to tell you when they want you to have the project done. They're gonna say, May of 2025, which sitting here in March of 23 seems far away, but when you start to look at the timeline of how long it takes to apply and how long does my dealer say that they're gonna need and how much time does the utility need to get my site ready, that timeline seems like maybe not long enough. So really thinking through, when do you want to have your truck on the road? When is the utility saying you can have that infrastructure in place? and making sure that that meets the requirements of the program. Next slide. Okay, so in order to help you wrap your mind around what we mean when we say apply for a grant, I have put together a short list of the items that we see most frequently for both a vehicle application and for an infrastructure application. So on the vehicle side, most of the information that you're going to need to put together is going to be about your existing vehicle. Of course, they're gonna to wanna to know what you plan on getting. So you do need to start talking to your, your dealers so that you can uh, get a quote. But most of the information is going to be, you know, how many miles do you operate annually? And can you take pictures of things like the engine label, which may have fallen off and you have to get a copy or the or the VIN label, which is completely illegible, and you might have to get that replaced. They're also going to want to see that the it's owned by you and has been owned by you. They're very importantly going to want to make sure that you're in compliance because I didn't say this at the beginning. I'll say it now. If you are out of compliance with any local, state, or federal regulations, you're not able to go after grant funding. You can only go after grant funding if you are currently in compliance and ahead of any compliance deadline that is going to be relevant to you. So they're going to ask for demonstration of compliance with state rules. And that is what's required on the vehicle side in a nutshell. And on the infrastructure side, some of these be are things that maybe um, you haven't worked with before, which is why getting as far out ahead of a program is important. It's why in that earlier slide, I included the status just so that you could see if a program was already open, which may be, which may mean that you're in a crunch now to get your application in because the program's already open versus a program that is under development and isn't open yet, meaning you may have more time to work with. So on the infrastructure side, things that a grant agency are going to look for are Again, quotes and bids from who's going to provide your charger and who's going to install that charger to demonstration that you're already talking to your utility provider. They're going to want to know that you have an EV on order. Um, timing is such a, a crazy puzzle here. You, you don't want to get your electric vehicle and not be able to charge it but you also don't wanna just have chargers sitting there not being used. And so as much as you can, you wanna line up the delivery of your vehicle and then making sure that your infrastructure is charged and ready to go um, ahead of when your vehicle arrives. You're also gonna to have to demonstrate that you have an agreement to have charging at that location, whether that is you own that site or you have a lease. And then in both cases, you're going to have to tell the grant agency who you are, um, your business name, your domicile address. You're going to have to, you know, sign and, and say, we are interested in this funding and we agree to um, have our project in place and do all of the required reporting. You can go to the next slide. Okay, 
So this is a little bit small because there are multiple steps, but I'm gonna talk you through it. We did start to allude to timelines quickly earlier. So to reiterate some points, this doesn't happen very fast. And you are likely at least six months out from today. If you said, I wanna go after something today, you are likely half a year, if not longer, out from having a contract that would allow you to get started on your project. So identifying the opportunity is the first step. You may have to do some research to do that. The GNA team is providing free technical assistance, which we'll talk about, and identifying opportunities is part of that. The application process can take one to two months. If your documentation is all ready to go, you can do it much quicker than that, but conservatively, give yourself a nice window in case you need to order new engine tags or new VIN labels. And then even if you super, super, super hustle to get your application in, that agency needs time to review it, make sure it's complete. They may have some questions. So there's gonna be an evaluation window of anywhere from one to three months. And then they're gonna send you a contract. And this may be language that you've never seen before. And so you may take some time just reading through that, making sure you're comfortable, asking for some changes. So between identifying an opportunity all the way through contracting, that's easily half a year. So we're talking in March. This could mean that if we did something today in the fall of this year, you get the authorization to do your project. And it takes a while to get vehicles. It takes a long time to get infrastructure in place. So you're going to see that you have a window of anywhere from half a year to three years to complete your project, depending on the program. And then after you demonstrate that you have paid for the equipment, it's operational, you submit for reimbursement. So I think that's a really important point to call out. Grant funding is provided on a reimbursement basis. You make your request, you complete your project, and then they send you a check to reward you for doing what you said you were going to do. And then after you get paid, you get to do reporting for anywhere from one year to seven years, depending on your contract terms. And you wanna make sure that you complete that reporting. Otherwise, the grant agency may come back and say, hey, what is this vehicle? Is it on the road? Did you move it out of state? Did you take it out of service? So make sure that you just know you are going to be required to operate the vehicle for a certain amount of time and likely in a certain area. Okay. All right. So you can go to the next slide. That's everything that I wanted to go through as far as just a grant introduction. And we're going to turn it over to some Q&A. So if you have questions, please do drop them into the chat. I do have a couple that have already come in that I'm going to address. And then um, we'll just turn it over for some closing remarks after we do some questions. All right, so the emphasis of this has been on zero emission. There's a question talking about low NOx engines and renewable natural gas and whether or not those will qualify as zero emission. And unfortunately, no. So if you have a, a, a CNG truck with a Cummins natural gas engine and you're using renewable natural gas from a dairy um, or other feedstock, unfortunately that will not meet the requirements of the, the advanced clean fleet rule. Um, there's a question about a disadvantaged community and knowing how to determine that. So. There are two quick ways to do this. One is through um, a website called Cal Enviro Screen, C-A-L-E-N-V-I-R-O-S-C-R-E-E-N, Cal Enviro Screen. If you go to that website and you type in your address, you will go ahead and just get to click on your address and it's going to show you a little box of different you know, metrics about your location. And the top one is going to say Cal Enviro Screen percentile. And if that percentile is in the upper 25th percentile, so anything 75% or above, you are in a disadvantaged community. 
And an even simpler way is if you Google SB 535, that's going to show you a map with red highlighting on it. And you can, again, type in your address. And if you are within the highlighted regions, you are in a disadvantaged community. OK. And then just one more question here has to do with if I'm not going to have charging at my site, where can I do it publicly? Well, that's a great question. There are two um, things that I'll reference. One is that I know the Port of San Diego is thinking about this. And this is a you know webinar session focused on dredge. So last year, <laughs> I know the Port of San Diego issued an RFI to just get some feedback on where, where they could put charging. I know they have some goals in the mid 2020s to have charging, but Phil, I saw you popped on. So any comments on charging for drainage fleets in the San Diego area? Sure, yeah, and thanks for, for the question. And again, this is another question we get all the time. And when, when it comes to charging, I mean, if, if a, a truck operator or a fleet can put it at their location, best case scenario, right? And charging overnight is going to produce the lowest cost um, for operation of that vehicle. But that's not going to be the case for, for everybody. Um, everybody is trying to find out where public charging can go to support this transition. Uh, here at the Port of San Diego, uh, we will be releasing an RFP, a request, a request for proposals this spring to develop a charging site on some of the land that we manage along San Diego Bay. So um, that will be focused on um, uh, battery electric truck charging um, capabilities. So more to come in that realm. Um, something like that won't be developed for quite some time, probably in you know another year, year and a half or so. But um, we're making a move to get that infrastructure installed at the port so that truck drivers that are in the San Diego region and especially those that are visiting our port are going to have a place to charge their vehicles. I super appreciate that. Um, thank you, Phil. And beyond that, I will share that there is a tool that is updated pretty regularly from the Alternative Fuels Data Center and it's their station locator. And word of caution, if you go to that tool, you're going to see all kinds of chargers on that site, that they are likely not friendly towards anything more than a passenger vehicle. So if you are trying to use uh, tools that are out there and it shows all kinds of charging locations, make sure you're looking at the name of that location. You know, Walmart parking lot probably isn't going to be the best fit. And if any doubt, drive by it or they all have phone numbers give them a call are you friendly towards a 53 foot you know trailer those types of things you know what Brie, one then, more oh go ahead sorry to interrupt you no, you're uh, fine. i know down in the san diego region the first electric truck stop has been um developed um with uh truck net there are truck stop down in otai mesa uh, and they do have two um, high power chargers at their location. So they're a fuel stop already. They you know, sell diesel, CNG fuel. They have amenities there at their truck stop for, for um, truck drivers. Uh, but they also have two brand new um, high power chargers there for any battery electric trucks that can start charging there. So that's the one location I know about in San Diego and more to come. Okay. Thank you for that. And there's just one other question that I'm going to answer, and then we're going to talk about the tech assistance if you want to stick around. Okay, so I got a question about checking on the status of your grant application, and that's a really great question. Um, so there are two ways. One is most of these applications are now through an online portal, and so they update the status in that portal. So you may log in and it will say submitted pending review. Um, if they have questions, that portal will then reflect the, the questions that they have and the action items. And you'll, they'll give you a deadline and then you respond to that deadline. Um, so the online portal that you can log in and check the status of your application is one way. The second way, which is the way that I deploy more often, is calling, hey, calling on behalf of so-and-so, 
you know, can you provide an update on when the review process will be complete or do you need anything else at this time? So um, you can check through your application portal. You can also just call at any time just for a status update. Okay, so let's talk about a free offering that's available to drainage fleets in the San Diego area. You can take it to our next slide. Okay, so today you heard from me about grant funding last week there was a webinar on regulations and tech offerings also from gna so if you have questions if you want to talk about your particular site if you want to talk about your regulatory strategy if you want to start working on a grant the port of san diego is offering free technical assistance and so there's a qr code on your screen if you scan that it's going to take you to a page to sign up for a introductory call just to you know ask you some questions about where you are where you're at in the process or what you'd like to focus on and then from there we will put together a strategy just for you to help you start working on these items there's you know this is first come first served and we're going to we're going to work with you as as much as we can um, without you know a, a limit unless we're completely swarmed so i just want to make sure that you're aware of this resource to get more hands-on support and phil if there's anything you want to add to that you can go ahead and do so sure no thanks thanks brie yeah you know we we recognize that the the transition to zero emission trucks is daunting for for many of our fleets that are serving our port so we thought it would be a good idea to provide this type of technical assistance for folks to better understand those regulations, learn more about incentives, learn more about the trucks, the chargers, everything that Bree just, just spoke about. And as you can see, it's, it, it's, not, it's not an easy ecosystem out there. Um, so that's why we brought in GNA that can provide that one-on-one -on -one technical assistance with you. And we definitely urge ports that are, or fleets that are coming to our port to take advantage of that. I know you have questions and GNA is a, world-class consultant group that understands this technology really well and i think they'll be able to provide a lot of great support to you so please take advantage of it thank you so much phil i appreciate that and that's really all we're going to go through today so thank you for joining in please do share this recording and last week's with anyone that you think would benefit from it and um, on our final slide here, you're just going to see that there is going to be a quick survey. So please do take the time to fill that out. And again, appreciate your time and hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you so much.